Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this week's Coventry University Geography webinar. Um, thank you for all coming along. Um, sorry if you can hear a bit of background noise from me, um, hopefully it's not too loud. Um, a bit of a building sign place at the moment, but yeah. Um, so just a, a couple of quick things before I hand over to my fantastic colleague Mike. Just um, wanted to apologise about some of the, the stuff that happened in the session two weeks ago. Uh, with Dr. Jason Jordan's uh, talk. That is all now, we still did it. We set up another link and recorded the session as well and did some Q and A as we would normally. So that's all um, That's all live or that's all accessible on our YouTube page. So he's, he did a fantastic talk, which was all, all which is called All at Sea, the ups and downs of sea level with the occasional giant wave thrown in for effect. And he looked at um, sea level change, particularly historically, um, but also kind of looking to the future as well and started to think about maybe some links between uh, hazards and, and maybe even some of the stuff we looked at in Matt, in what, in Matt Blackett's early video, the very first one of these that we did, and starting to bring it to tsunamis. Uh, so that's all up on our, on our, our YouTube page, so please feel free to have a look for that. If you can't find it, um, please just send me an email, um, craig.lashford at coventry.ac.uk. I'm more than happy to, to share that or send us a send us a tweet. Um, please follow us on our Instagram and Twitter accounts, uh, Co Coventry Geography. You should be able to find us quite nicely. Um, and if anyone wants to be part of the mailing list, any teachers as well, as always, just send me an email. This is the, I think this is the 12th in the series that we've done, um, ranging from a whole host of different topics for, from human and physical geography. Uh, so please feel free to, to, to get in touch. And I'm more than happy to add you to a mailing list because this is something we're, we're kind of going to continue doing certainly in the foreseeable. Also, while I've got you here, I want to uh, mention about our fantastic session for next week uh, with Dr. Marion McClellan. Uh, so it'll be the same time at 4.30 next Wednesday, the, um, the 21st, uh, yeah, 21st of April. And her session will be, will be on international development. So it'll be titled International Development, Who's, Why's and How's. Um, and that's, she's a, she's a development geographer, so very much more on the human geography side, uh, her session next week. So that's um, kind of a bit of the admin stuff, I think, out of the way. I, today's session will be with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my colleague, Dr. Mike Kennedy. So Mike is a senior lecturer with us at Coventry, but a uh, background in very much as an environmental scientist. So uh, a bit more of the biological side of things. He's going to start to talk about how that links into geography. Um, he did his PhD at the University of Glasgow, uh, which he completed in 2001, which was titled Pre uh, Predicting the Impact of Hydrological Change on Wetland Vegetation. He teaches quite a bit. He's been, been at Coventry for seven years now, or approaching seven years, I think we were discussing the other day, maybe coming up in December, I think he said. Uh, and his teaching background is on biodiversity, ecology, and he's very much um, leading on some of our key bio, biogeography modules um, on our, particularly our physical geography degree. And his, his lecture today is gonna to focus a bit on biodiversity, uh, biodiversity loss, some of the threats, opportunities, and link back to some of the big questions that we've got, you know, climate change, which has been a consistent thing for a number of our sessions, but also maybe reflect on um, the pandemic as well. So, um, he's put his, he's put his um, or the Mentimeter slides up, so I'll have them access to me. So please feel free to, to, to drop us some questions. We'll have the normal Q&A at the end, as always. But either, other, otherwise, I'm going to hand you over to, to Mike and let him start off. Over to you, Mike. Cheers. Easy, yeah. There you go. See you a bit, Mike. Cheers. He was there and then he went again. Thanks very much for that. Um... Introduction, Craig, very much appreciated. Um, and to everybody, sorry, I've still got my, my lockdown haircut, so I apologise for that and we'll just have to bear with it for this video. As Craig said, I've had quite a, a varied past. So yeah, my PhD was in Glasgow, looking at hydrology, interactions with ecology. Uh, my first degree was in biology, but I've had various experience on postdocs since looking at wetland hydrology, water quality, and ecological management in both the UK <clears throat> and a, a wider African context. So hopefully uh, some of the issues Craig mentioned, such as hazards, um, climate change, losses to biodiversity, I'll try and link those, maybe 
lead back to some of the or, or link back to some of the earlier presentations that we've had. Uh, as we all know, geography is a, a very varied subject area and we all have a lot of different expertise, but we try to bring these together in a coherent way within our, our um, teaching and within our modules. And I think, uh, as has already, I'm sure, been mentioned to you, we have the physical geography, the human geography and the geography and natural hazard degrees. And I think a lot of the things that I touch upon today will link back to those and they're things that are relevant to those degrees. So, uh, as, as Greg said, um, we have the, the Mentimeter here. So if you do have any questions or any comments, you can put those in and we'll try and address those at the end. Okay. So what I'm gonna try and cover today, it's a, it's a huge subject area. Um, hopefully I won't talk for too long. So many other slides I could have put in here, so many other things, avenues we could have explored. I'm trying to touch on some of the major points. Um, think about what is biodiversity? How do we measure it? It's a term that we're all aware of that's banded around a lot. But what is it exactly? How do we need to think about it in, in order to actually conserve it? What are current threats to biodiversity? You notice that I put in some of there. So we know what some of the major threats are. There are possibly threats that we've not identified as yet. So we need to be aware of this also in terms of conservation strategies. Also, what are some of the benefits that biodiversity confers to us as a human, as a human society? And why, thinking more actually, could that be a, a problem for, for human societies? What are the ultimate costs and consequences going to, going to be of that, of that ongoing biodiversity loss if we don't halt it and address it? And finally, what, what do we know so far? Are there things that we know? And what more do we need to know to enable those successful conservation strategies? Uh, a lot of the thinking has been a bit disjointed in the past, and in some ways it probably still is a little bit disjointed. But we need to connect those together with kind of an integrated way of thinking in order to enable these more successful strategies. So hopefully I'll touch on some of those things today, not necessarily in that exact order, but I will touch on those and probably jump back and forth between topics to some degree. So what is biodiversity? It's a contraction of the term biological diversity. It's as simple as that. And from uh, a convention that you may have heard of, it's known globally as the Rio Convention, but the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was held in Rio de Janeiro in the early 1990s, 1992. And this statement came from that actual convention. Um, so what it means is the variability among living organisms from all sources. These might be terrestrial, marine, other aquatic sources, but also the ecological complexes, so how these things interact with each other, the ecosystems of which they're a part. And I think importantly here, we might think about biodiversity just in terms of species. So as, as humans, Homo sapiens, were a species. And we might think about other ecosystems or habitats being composed of a number of individual species. But we can drive further down than that. We need to think about genetic diversity. So if you have a rare species, does it have very small subpopulations? Are those subpopulations not genetically diverse? Does, it, does that make them more susceptible to potential uh, loss or potential extinction. But we also need to go up and think about ecosystems and how these things interact with each other. So we need to think about biodiversity on these different levels and hopefully we'll discuss and cover that some of that as we go along. Um, just a snapshot here. We obviously have biodiversity, it's all over the earth. We have different levels of biodiversity. But I think what most of us are aware of are very biodiverse areas, areas with high levels of species, so just particularly very diverse areas. Or perhaps we could think of areas with high levels of endemicity, so where we have species that are found there and perhaps nowhere else. So these could be some of the island ecosystems. So Madagascar, for example, we have the lemurs, diverged historically from other primates, mainland Africa. They're not really found anywhere else on Earth. So high level of endemicity. 
This is an ongoing process. Areas are being described, new species being discovered, and the most recent biodiversity hotspot described um, is the North American coastal plain. So thinking about this, you might be thinking this is biology, but it's also geography. And this is sort of the, the basis and principle for biogeography and biogeographical study. As Craig mentioned, I lead a module in the second year, it's called Biodiversity and Environmental Change. My colleague, Michelle Farrell, who gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago, also spoke about her involvement in this module. But we need to think about what, what is controlling? What are the major environmental gradients that are controlling specific levels of biodiversity? Apart from we find very biodiverse systems along the equator, tropical or subtropical regions. So a lot of these systems, parts of the tropical um, rainforests, they don't experience particularly extreme climatic variability. They've not been glaciated in recent history. So they've had a long time to develop, for thick soils to de develop, for diverse ecosystems to develop. The more extreme latitudes, we've obviously got environmental pressures, climatic pressures, such as low light levels, low temperature conditions, which controls what species we find there. Other areas, an area I've got a particular interest in, um, through working there, having friends there, is the area around Costa Rica, Panama. So this is the isthmus between South America and North America. So this is really a landscape that's evolved quite recently in geological and global terms in the last several thousand years. So we're getting uplift there, we're getting a lot of tectonic activity, we're getting activity through volcanoes, which has created a lot of niches, as we call them, for species to inhabit, to utilize, and then to um, evolve and diversify. So these are all, as I said, the basics of biogeography. Why do we find species? Why do we find them? What's controlling their distribution? And why do we get different levels of biodiversity within these regions? <clears throat> so let's think about what are some of the major threats and challenges to biodiversity at a global level. So here we have a statement a couple of years ago from the IPBES, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. There, Estimate was that up to around a million species might be at risk of extinction globally. But it's a very complex story. It's not as easy to answer as some areas of science. We can't do a test tube experiment. We can only make estimates in many cases. Consensus among a lot of the literature, this was reviewed in 2017, is that possibly around 11 million species globally. Other people, other researchers suggest there might be as many as six billion. Um, probably of that, we've, we've got about 1.5 million that we've actually described in any level of detail. So a lot out there, some things that we do know, a lot that we don't know. And of those 11 million species, it's thought that possibly up to 90% of them are insects. So things that people might not have studied much degree in the past, they're not large enigmatic species, they're things that we, we don't necessarily see, they've not necessarily been reviewed in any systematic way. And even those groups that we, we do know about, so beetles, the beetle family, uh, Coleoptera, a uh, very diverse group, um, very important in many ecosystems. So here we have examples such as the, the dung beetle, important across large areas of, of Africa, very important in reincorporating nutrients into um, quite arid soils, um, moving seeds, et cetera, and keeping nutrient balancing in check within soils. So we do know some of that, we've probably seen those on documentaries, but still probably a lot of research needs to be carried out to understand their ecological requirements and the threats to them. And on the right-hand side here, um, you might recognize this stag beetle. Again, it's quite a big enigmatic species. We have it in the UK, it's a native to UK habitats. <clears throat> it's something people historically have had interest in. Within the UK, we've got a good historical record of biological data. 
The Victorians 100, 150 years ago were very keen on going out, collecting things, describing them. So we've got probably one of the best biological records in the world within the UK. Things like this were often of interest, but there's still a lot that we don't know about the stag beetle. So linking back to teaching, to research, we've got, I've currently got a final year student who's doing a, a project on stag beetles in Epping Forest, trying to look at their actual habitat requirements. There's not a lot known about those and trying eventually to put together um, what's called a um, PVA, population viability analysis model. So this is an important tool in conservation management and I'll give you a fuller example later on. But basically this tells us about the, the information we know. What kind of climates are important for this species? What are its food requirements? What are its habitat requirements? How well distributed is the population? And for other species, what are their kind of social interactions? Are they solitary animals? Or do they have certain hierarchical structures within a population? And these are all important things we need to know in terms of conservation. So just trying to point out there that there are links, there are students doing interesting and relevant projects within geography degrees at Coventry. And <clears throat> going back to those specific biodiversity threats, uh, this was a report, Living Planet report from just two years ago, looking at the major loss is the major threat to biodiversity loss. So we've got different taxonomic groups, birds, reptiles, mammals, fish. For a lot of these, a large proportion of loss of, of various species within these groups is due to habitat degradation. So humans modifying the landscape for urbanization or perhaps for agriculture, and perhaps completely removing that habitat for species or, or fragmenting it. We're all probably aware of the Amazon rainforests, where you have fragmentation, roads going through the forest, leading to disruption of habitat for, for movement of animals. Um, but there are other issues as well. That's one of the major causes. But something else I'll talk about later is invasive species and impacts and costs of invasive species on vulnerable populations and implications for conservation. As Craig mentioned earlier, there's also issues of climate change. We might have a, an isolated population of a certain species on an island. If we get changes in sea level temper sea temperatures or changes in atmospheric temperatures, it may um, compromise the physiology of those species. It may drive them towards extinction. And an issue for some groups, such as fish, is that of exploitation. So that's over harvesting, primarily going and fishing too many things out of the sea, not doing that at a sustainable level. So you've probably heard about carrying capacity within ecosystems. And this is part of it. We, we can't overfish things. We can't over harvest things. Um, so a good example would be the cod around Cape Cod. That fisher which collapsed many decades ago through overfishing. There wasn't a, an ability to reproduce. There was a, a collapse in the population. And that is a fisher that's still recovering. And this is see, being seen in similar ways around the globe. So these are all things I will touch upon as we go along. A, an example we're all hopefully aware of is that of the African lion. So brilliant animals, beautiful animals, very Again, a species with a very complex hierarchy, often one or two dominant females, dominant male. Those may be the other ones that mate. It's difficult for individuals to move between prides of lions. So if we get loss of habitat, we will get fragmentation of those populations. This map essentially shows in this kind of purplish, mauvish, not particularly attractive color. This represents the historic range of the African lion. And this is sort of late 1800s, up until the, the turn of last century, a very wide ranging species. It can be found across a range of habitats. It's really just excluded from those very arid desert zones and some of the swampy coastal regions. 
we compare that to what in 2016 was in the green, the areas where lions are currently found. So you can see that as a, there is a big fragmentation of those populations. There's not going to be that same level of genetic exchange between those populations. They may become um, genetically weakened or less diverse genetically. So these, again, implications for, for the management of that species. There are some attempts to reintroduce lions to, to certain areas um, or an assessment of areas where lions might still be able to, to be reintroduced and to sustain populations. But again, there are issues with reintroducing these things in the wild, having those pride structures, which are very important in terms of how they interact with each other. So the sad story is that over the last 100 years or so, it's thought that there's been around a 90% population decline in the African lion. So not a good um, future outlook. And I know this is something that Jade, again, spoke about in, in a previous session, global population um, over exploitation of resources. And here we can just see where we are getting very much high levels of population increase are in the less developed regions, such as Africa, and in many countries where we are finding the remaining but diminishing lion populations. And I won't dwell upon this, this slide too much. So it's a repeat of that previous slide that we saw. And you can see a link between that. We have areas in the yellow where the lions still exist, but at the same time, we're getting very dense populations of humans, very dense urbanization in some areas. These are areas where we may previously have had lion populations, but the likelihood now is that if they are to be introduced successfully, they need sufficient range area. We need to try and avoid human animal conflict. That is where lions might go and take livestock from, from farmers or a suitable range of habitat and other prey species might be lost. So it's, it's not a good picture for some species such as the African lion, and we need to try and address these issues. So again, um, perhaps less well known to some of you, perhaps these are some examples that you have seen before. But again, it's about learning through research. And I know myself and other colleagues at Coventry, we try to introduce areas of interest, but also areas of our own research into our teaching and give real live examples. Important, try and cover important issues. At the top here, um, some of you may recognize this species. It has been in the news, several news items over the last few years. Uh, there is a, a, a specimen of this at Oxford Natural History Museum, if you've ever been there or if you want to go there and see it. It's a very strange creature. It was called the tubal stalk, but it's not actually related to stalk. It's got a very small population distribution. Um, it's found across uh, Namibia, Uganda, and Zambia. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I'm still recording here. You are, Mike, it's fine. I think your camera's just frozen, but you, we can still hear you absolutely perfectly fine. Um, can people still hear me? Yeah, 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 absolutely fine, oh, Mike. Okay. Your, camera, your, your camera's frozen, so your face seems to have Yes, there, okay, guys. never mind, that, that might you're be a all, good thing. So it's, you're found, all good. it's found a um, small population throughout Namibia, Uganda, and Zambia. And Zambia's there, I can see it. It has very specific habitat requirements. It's found in... Um, wetland edge ecosystems amongst papyrus swamp. It migrates. It feeds mainly upon um, what are called bubble fish. That's its main food source. And these fish inhabit sort of marginal, deoxygenated, often quite warm waters. Um, there are human pressures upon papyrus swamps. There's loss through drainage for conversion to agriculture, through burning, whether that's accidental, uh, anthropogenic, or whether it's uh, natural fire. Bangwe live in northern Zambia. 
but we don't really understand much about the species yet, what its importance is. Uh, you may hear about talk of keystone species. So this could be a keystone species. If we lose that, will that ecosystem change dramatically? Will it collapse? Um, more locally, for those of you uh, who are in Coventry or, or Warwickshire, the water vole is a species which we get here. Um, it's found in other areas of the UK. Again, it likes wet areas. What we do know is that between 1990 and 1998, there was thought to be uh, around about an 80% population decline in the UK. So some of that is due to habitat loss, but a major issue is ongoing mink predation. So minks which have escaped into the wild in the UK historically. And again, this does have some levels of UK and EU protection to the Wildlife and Countryside Act, uh, Ramsar Act. And there are um, projects going on within organisations such as the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust to try and understand why those populations are still declining and how we can address those issues. And again, I've had students in the past, a current student who are looking into some of these issues. So we have all these kind of opportunities for this kind of research and learning at Coventry with local partners. So going back to the, the crux of the title from earlier, what does biodiversity do for us? What does it ever do for us? This may be a concept that you've come across more recently, it's ecosystem services. So it's trying to think how ecosystems are important for the humans. Again, what benefits do they confer? Um, and the statement from the WF is that ecosystem services really relate to the wide array of conditions and processes through which ecosystems and their associated biodiversity confer benefits on humanity. And we can think about these in a number of ways. So there might be provisioning. So it's provision of food. It could be crops or it could be wild foods that we get. Uh, raw materials such as building materials. There may be medicines that we already get from natural sources or things that we've not yet discovered. Water quality is regulated. There's a prevention of soil erosion. Um, supporting things such as soil formation, so the basis of farming systems of growing crops and nutrient recycling. There's also this category of cultural ecosystem services, things which provide human benefits, just a nice walk in a green area, uh, providing good mental health and well-being. So we often think about things such as um, pollination. We would often think about bees and bee species. But there are actually a wider, far wider range of species that provide these services and benefits. So we have things such as bats, birds, even wasps, other insects, black flies, which all provide those pollinating services. Going back to perhaps, you know, linking back to Craig's talk of several weeks ago now, thinking about catchment management and slowing the flow. Well, we have this natural coverage of vegetation. We have dampening of this hydrograph. So the land is able to absorb and hold back some of that water. Well, we have a coverage of concrete, of hard urban surfaces, then we get this much more rapid rise in the hydrograph, in that rising limb, and we get issues of flooding, downstream flooding, et cetera. Uh, in many developing countries. So here we have an example of mangroves. They provide multiple ecosystem services. They um, provide local climate regulation. They uh, prevent erosion of soils and of soils inland, but also on the coast. And they can also be a source of both protein of food, so very good beds for young fish, but also natural oyster beds that can form food for local communities or a source of income for those communities to, to sell them on. So a lot, of, a lot of ecosystems provide a lot of these multiple services. So again, just going back to some of the headlines. Um, so there've been issues such as uh, 
palm oil plantations. We're all becoming aware of that. Again, Jade shared the image of the orangutan that she sponsored several weeks back, heavily impacted by the loss of native vegetation cover in the areas of Papua. Uh, last year, we had the fires, some of them set, some of them wildfires, which tore through large areas of the Brazilian Amazon. So a big impact upon the local biodiversity, a lot of local biodiversity loss. Other examples in Australia. And these statements from well-known researchers such as Jane Goodall, a primate researcher, thinking that attacks on nature are contributing to, potentially to health crises. Okay, I hope you see where I'm going with this. And her suggestion that when this is over, when the pandemic is over, I think you all know what I mean by the pandemic, we need to try and protect nature and biodiversity. I think we, we don't need, we can't wait until it's necessarily over. We need to increase that now. We need to think more, more be more determined about those approaches. Um, other researchers thinking natural habitats are disturbed. This enables pathogens that were in wild reservoirs that weren't, humans weren't exposed to. Our removal of biodiversity or, or modification by the biodiversity has led to those diseases spreading to humans, sometimes via the livestock that we use. Some of these diseases, called zoonotic diseases, when they're within wild animals, they don't produce a big, big effect in those wild species. They may have a, a tolerance to them. When humans are exposed to them, then we can suffer far more. It can be minor illnesses or they can be life-threatening illnesses. Okay, so you can't really avoid thinking about, you know, I'm talking about disease, about the current COVID-19 virus, but also think about other pandemics. And in many ways, the thinking is that the loss of biodiversity has led to these issues. So, you know, who was to blame? Was it the wet market in cities such as Wuhan, where meat is for sale and sometimes live animals for sale? Was there an intermediary between other wild populations, other wild species and the wet market, such as the pangolin. This is one of the most heavily trafficked uh, mammal species on the planet, but you might find them at locations such as the wet market in Wuhan. But are they necessarily to blame? I think the stories we don't necessarily know yet. Previous outbreaks of diseases such as SARS, it's taken maybe 10, 15 years to find out what that link was. And while there is research going into this, we don't yet know that. So the bats, are they friends or foe? Again, this is an example of fruit bats, Zambia, straw colored fruit bats. <clears throat> when I was looking to be working out there, there was a group of researchers from Japan who were investigating these as potential vectors of transmission for Ebola virus. And they were doing genetic studies, you're taking blood samples, looking for immunological markers, and they actually found that there was no evidence in this population. This population is around about 18 million fruit bats, which congregate from all over areas of sub-Saharan Africa onto an area of woodland within a small national park. So they've come from all over Africa, but there was no evidence of Ebola within this particular species. So we may suspect pathways, but quite often we're, we're not correct with those suspicions. So are they friends and foe? I think sometimes we can demonize certain species in some ways. So perhaps they may be friendly adversaries, or they may be demonized. We think of vampire bats. We've all heard stories of vampire bats. Out of the many, many species of bats, there are only three that are thought to have this vampire habit that actually feed upon blood. And obviously in, in popular literature, characters such as you know, Dracula, vampires, from demonized. I think I'd be right saying we, we shouldn't really be doing this. I think it's an unfair thing to uh, reflect on the bats. They shouldn't be demonized in this way. And perhaps global learning needs to adapt to this. So we've got a nice, nice little drawing for you here, biodiversity as a regulator, what are, what are the tipping points? So you're really going back to what we've just spoken about, but 
This diagram it might look a bit daunting is from a paper just last year, which represents a meta-analysis of um, academic papers and environmental reports, looking at where diseases have been tracked between wild populations, between wild taxa, such as primates, carnivores, but also through domestic animals. And obviously humans then have interaction with these domestic animals. And these are represented by these larger blue spots in the middle. Um, the lines represent viruses, etc., or the transmission between the viruses. And we have different colored dots, such as primates down here. So this far, um, this far example, there's going to be very many transmission pathways between these wild primates and either domestic animals or humans in order for disease to be transferred. And just the, the implications of this is biodiversity aids this if these animals are within an area of habitat which is intact and good for them they're less likely to need to move to feed to find new habitat but they're less likely to be in contact with human populations therefore those diseases are less likely to spread between those populations and biodiversity is a very good regulator very good disease controller so we therefore need to maintain it. Okay, and some examples, these things are domestic animals, things we might use in farming or we might eat as a food source or use for clothing, such as horses, sheep, cows, pigs. Very high level of interaction between humans and those domesticated animals globally. Um, we also get other interactions. So very long history of interaction between humans and dogs, or dogs ultimately derived from the, the grey wolf. And hard to believe sometimes that these are very highly related in terms of genetics to things such as pugs and other breeds of dog, uh, still compatibly, still produce viable offspring. So we have that global distribution of dogs and other cats, etc. We also have other, perhaps less globally important um, species, such as llamas, alpacas, camels, goats there up in their tree, donkeys, all of which humans have had a long interaction with. Again, they're part of this transmission process, but some are perhaps more globally important than others. That global importance represented there by the size of the, the circle. And then we have the other species, not domesticated, but which have adapted very well to human habitats. So things such as fox, uh, rats, they have responded very well. They don't necessarily have specific habitat requirements. So they, they eat our food, they eat our leftovers, and they have expanded their range. Where some species have been pushed out by biodiversity loss, other species have managed to adapt and expand their range. So I'll just touch briefly upon alien invaders as well. What happens when something comes into a system that's not there? In this case, we're not, we're not talking about little green men in spaceships, we're talking about things that move into other habitats that they weren't formerly in. So in this case, an example here from the Environment Agency, we have the white clawed crayfish, which is native to the UK and the American signal crayfish, which was introduced at some point last century to UK rivers. Uh, unfortunately, it carries bacteria uh, known as uh, a disease known as crayfish plague, which it's fairly resistant to. If we get a, an individual in a river, that plague can transmit to the native populations which don't have immunity to this plague and we can lose entire populations of the native crayfish. So these are invaders modifying the habitat. Uh, more international example on island ecosystems we have iguana populations that have been impacted by cats so they will eat the adults and impact upon the populations and there's a huge cost to this so over the last from 1970 to 
to 2017, there was seen to be a, a cost in, in terms of um, trillions of dollars in terms of treating the impacts or trying to uh, mediate against the impacts of a, of a range of, of taxa. There are things such as mosquitoes carrying diseases such as malaria, Zika virus, dengue fever, rats, which come in and might impact upon populations of bird species eating eggs or eating grain, etc. Cats, so giving you the example there, but also a range of snake species, insect species, which have detrimental impacts upon either ecosystems or food resources for humans. Okay, so move on now. We have therefore seen historically species extinctions and declines for a variety of reasons. Uh, the top one here we have Stella sea cow. So this was a species which was brought to decline, brought to extinction by early fishing crews. It was harvested for its blubber as a food source, used its blubber for other reasons, and it was made extinct now quite a, quite a while ago. Passenger pigeons this might be a story you've come across as a ubiquitous species across many states of North America, found in high numbers before European settlers came in and really expanded across North America. But those humans, again, responsible, they managed to shoot this species into extinction by around 1914. So those are species that are extinct. We can't necessarily do anything about that. We can't bring them back. There are also species which um, are seeing ongoing declines. They're at the edge. They're very vulnerable. So species such as the Garvan rhino, Sumatran rhino, both have population levels thought to be below 100 individuals. Um, also some declines and some slight increases in other rhino populations, but still very low levels. I think if you just put this into context, you, you might all remember going on a, an aeroplane at some point in the past when we could still do that. So an aeroplane, uh, a Boeing 747, carries about 660 passengers. So it could fit the entire global populations of species such as Javan rhino and the Sumatran rhino onto the aeroplane several times over. Many other examples that you could give like that. These are things on the edge. There are also more recent potentially problems to, to conservation. So we have species such as the red panda and the African elephant. So in the last few years, it's come to light that what we thought were one species in each of these cases, are more than one species, probably two species. So they might have different requirements, whether we're trying to um, raise them in a, a captive environment or implement some sort of conservation plan within the field. We need to be aware that these are actually two different species and that need, they might need different approaches. So this has complicated the issue. So an organization that is important in species conservation is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. There are others, but probably too many to list here in the time that we've got. Uh, the link is there if you want to, to follow this. Um, so in the, the most recent report, 2021 list of threatened species, there have been 134,000 just over species assessed. So you think there might be 11 million species, there might be more. So we're just kind of, you know, scratching the surface there. Many species are thought to be threatened by things such as habitat loss or over-exploitation. Large numbers have gone extinct or extinct in the wild. And down here, we still have insufficient information about a lot of species. We don't know what their requirements are. So organizations such as OUCN, they do collate this information. For many, uh, I mentioned the, the PVA models earlier, they, they try to establish PVA models for various species. And now they are actually trying to bring in a habitat analysis as well, so a more rounded approach. And for many species, here we have the, the well-known Mauritius dodo, extinct some hundreds of years ago, regarded as extinct in the wild. Other species, so 
threats extinct. Other species might be critically endangered, so very, very small populations left or very fragmented populations. To vulnerable, there might be some recent decline, but it's not yet something we should be overly concerned about. An example of where uh, methods of conservation have been applied to try and recover a species is black-footed ferret, very enigmatic, cute little species found originally across the Western states of North America. It's now regarded as endangered perhaps moving towards critically endangered. The big red blob here represents where it used to be found, but it's now extinct. There are three small green spots you may be able to see, which is where it still occurs or where there have been attempts at reintroduction programs. So it's thought to be extinct in the wild in the 1970s. The populations have decreased because of habitat loss. So it requires kind of short scrubby bush land to, to, to feed in. A lot of that has been removed from the Western states because of conversion to agri for agriculture. There's also this sylvatic plague. So the bacteria Yerstis pestis, which creates bubonic plague in humans, was introduced to North America around the turn of last century, around 1900. And it can have an impact upon these populations. There's also a reduction in its food source, the prairie dog. So this is also susceptible to the bubonic plague, perhaps more so than the black-footed ferret, but also farmers that poisoned them, had poisoned the prairie dogs and had got rid of them because they were regarded as a pest. They dig burrows which disturb uh, the agriculture, etc. A small colony of the black-footed ferret was, however, discovered in the mid-1980s. So it hung on in there. There was a review of the population size. PVA report was produced in 2005. Hasn't, unfortunately, been updated since, as far as I can tell. The population was found to have very low genetic diversity. That leads into terms you might hear, such as genetic bottleneck or inbreeding. A population probably declined very rapidly. It lost a lot of beneficial genes that might have conferred protection against disease, etc. Also inbreeding, a lot of these things would be closely related to each other. So there were problems related with very closely related relatives mating with each other. So in the same way that you might have heard about Dolly the sheep in the past, cloning was used using other ferret species, captive ferret species, and introducing genetic material from frozen tissue samples into the eggs of these to produce black-footed ferret cloned offspring. Some of these were then released in the wild and the aim of this was to try and increase genetic diversity. There are ongoing reductions, but unfortunately the population is still declining. And the last report, about 2015, there were thought to be around 206 adult individuals, so sexually productive individuals in the wild. This is just one approach that I wanted to introduce to you. There are other approaches that we can use. I'm not going to dwell on this slide for too long. I realize we're, we're getting off the time. Um, a new thing you might want to look at gene drive technology. So it uses a technique called CRISPR. It can be used to eradicate unwanted species, such as uh, mosquitoes, which carry those diseases we talked about earlier. Basically, looking at the genetic sequence, taking out certain sections of that sequence and placing new ones in. So this can perhaps make these species sterile. You release sterile females into the environment they mate with the males. The males only mate once. There are no offspring, so we can reduce that, trying to eradicate these from certain areas. Similar approaches have been used in, in things such as rats, which can, as we've already said, impact upon islands. Or we might have rare species, in this case, the Kakapo pigeon, which is found within uh, New Zealand and islands of New Zealand. The rats eat the eggs and devastate the populations. But these can be controversial, heavily debated techniques. And this is something we would ask you to discuss in group sessions within classes in, in Coventry. Um, we also consider within the course of zoos and botanic gardens, what are the roles of them? Are they now improving? Do they have good reintroduction programs that might be successful, whereby we can rear things in captivity, reintroduce them to the wild? 
um, and a newly evolving area is DNA metabarcoding. So using a, a, a second DNA known as mitochondrial DNA, which comes from the mother down to offspring. And this can be used to look at communities. We can take a water sample. As long as we know what species are in there, we can detect them within that water sample. So that can be used for long-term monitoring or monitoring of remote, hard to reach environments. But really, what we need to consider here is that species conservation, these approaches must be coupled with habitat protection. If we're still losing the habitat, then we can't necessarily have successful reintroductions. This is more of a side issue. I'm not gonna um, dwell on this slide here. This is something I would potentially ask students in the class to think about this. Perhaps you can look back over this recording and answer some of these questions. Which of these woodland systems are the most threatened? What ecosystem services might they provide and how would we measure them? What do we need to know? Is it all about economics or do we need to know far more than that? I'll probably answer the last one though, which is the most threatened? I would probably say this top one, Brazilian rainforest, it's far more difficult to conserve areas of those remote rainforest. So we need inclusive approaches to biodiversity protection. We perhaps need to know who the stakeholders are. Are they big farming companies or are they local communities which might fish and provide, gain their, their food sources from wetland systems? How do these various stakeholders rely or impact upon their local ecosystems? We need to think about local context and knowledge. Okay, it's good to have expert advice, but we need to be aware of what these local people who've lived within these environments for centuries and know about these systems and what they can tell us about these systems. We can perhaps think about paying local communities to protect those services and those ecosystems or alternative livelihoods. I won't say too much about that. You can go away and think about that. It could be issues such as ecotourism. What role might they play in conservation? And again, we need to be aware of what we're preserving and why. This is a map of Hawaii um, reserves as they occurred at the end of last century, so 1980s up to the 1990s. There wasn't perhaps a connection between protected areas and endangered species. Many endangered species occurred outside of the protected areas. So that thinking needs to be joined up. We need reserves which are going to protect those, those species. And again, recent developments of things such as transfrontier conservation areas. So in Southern Africa, several nations working together to try and preserve those habitats that are important for the things we've seen, such as shoe bills, the elephants, those things which migrate over a wider area or migrate locally and protect also those habitats that they're found in. But again, this needs political will and collaboration between different states. So these can be issues which confound these kind of um, implications. So just to quickly summarize, you've got to see I've nearly finished, uh, biodiversity. I think you can say it's got many benefits for humans. There are many threats to biodiversity, which have habitat fragmentation, over-exploitation, climate change, natural hazards. Uh, so they're complex issues. And really to address them, we need multidisciplinary approach. We need people like geography students who have these wide range of interests, wide range of things that they're exposed to through their courses. And these are all issues that are covered in the geography courses. Um, so you can contact us and talk about any of these issues if you want, or perhaps you may have some questions. Hopefully this has been working. It has been mine, don't worry, I've been checking it all the way through. Great. Uh, it has, so fantastic. Thank you very much, that was excellent. I think it seems to have created a little weird um, thing behind, um, uh, something on the slide I think behind us possibly, um, just what we're yeah. doing. Don't worry about it, it's not, it's not um, the Mentimeters. Yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I can't leave at the moment, so. <laughs> no, all good. Um, so, right, so some questions, a good few questions have come in. 
uh, which is fantastic. So I've co- got a couple of things. But I'm actually going to start with the thing you ended on, if that's okay, which was linking it yep. back to your degree. And then I'll bring it back to your talk, if you don't mind, just because that was where you finished from. I thought it was quite a nice point. Um, is, uh, where, is, where, where do you teach this then throughout the, the kind of, throughout the geography degree? Do you, is it taught at all three levels? Are there, are there opportunities? Think, yeah. We introduce concepts for ecology and biodiversity in the first year. Um, the second year, we have a uh, module that's, that's mandatory for uh, physical geographies, uh, biogeography and environmental change. So, so both myself and Michelle teach. So we get the, the current contemporary context, but also the historical uh, context, the Holocene, uh, what, what more historical changes have there been. Uh, and then sort of thinking about biodiversity approaches to conservation, that's more in the third year. That's often quite a, a small but very interested group um, of biodiversity and conservation in the module. Um, so again, there's a bit of bit of biology in there, but it shouldn't be too scary. I think it's 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 an interesting uh, module for people who are interested, um, and people have got you know kind of employment off the back of of this kind of this information. Does that answer your question? mute myself absolutely perfectly yes mike i mean you, you're right i mean um you you want to you know your conclusion slide where you brought in all the different things that biodiversity is impacted by whether that be hazards climate change but also the things that it can offer opportunities for as well you know the ecosystem services slide that you mentioned earlier just shows what can kind of like, the importance really of, of understanding mm-hmm. biodiversity and, and the opportunity you can get from that thing it's so 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 important like you say yes it is kind of linked to that biology side of things or the you know environmental science side, but the absolute cornerstone of geography, isn't it? Yeah, um, geography is such a diverse subject area. Um, it does need to bring in all these these issues. And I think uh, I mentioned Jade, she gave a talk a few weeks ago. She I'm grateful she gave a talk on uh, that third year biodiversity and conservation module this year. So she gave a session. So bringing in the human geography side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also got another colleague, Tom Lavers, who thinks about the, the hazard side, the flooding issues, but how, uh, yeah, again, thinking how natural um, catchment management can help also protect biodiversity, but how we should approach that, what are the best ways to approach it? Yeah, and uh, well, actually going from that kind of human thought of conservation, I suppose, um, and you did kind of touch on it, so but I, I just thought you could I'd get you to expand a little bit. So, question has come in: Do you think conservationist charities like the WWF, for example, overpromote pre- the preservation of species, think, like for example the panda, uh, in comparison to things that are potentially deemed less cute, so things like the stag beetle? Um, and I think you did kind of touch on that. And then, is that therefore a bit of a concern? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of debate about that. I think there's been debate actually within WWF themselves as to whether they should change that species. So, you know, we call them flagship species, things like the panda. They're there. And people are aware of them. They've been aware of their decline in the past. But actually, the panda, there has been some success in terms of breeding programs, in terms of increasing wild populations. So they're not really as endangered as they were historically. And should we, should we bring in other areas? Should we... Should we think about sea slugs, for example? Could that be a, a, a flagship species? People are often revolted by these things. So it's, it's kind of a, it's balancing that argument. What is a, a species that people will get behind? But how can that be translated to, to managing the habitats? And that's something we need to get across. You can't just conserve species in isolation. We need that message that the habitats need to be conserved maintained or improved uh, so it's, it's a difficult debate it's not necessarily something that there's a, a single answer for but that's something we might discuss in a session in the third year what are people's perspectives on this through what they've learned what do they think how might they answer those questions and i think that's what makes probably a good conservation manager i think you're right it's exactly that it's having a really uh, an informed debate about it on a really important topic because I think that another question has come in that kind of really does link to that really nicely. Um, and you talked about, you know, cons- conserving, you know, certain species, but also the reintrodu- reintroduction of species. So obviously, you know, think of things like the red kite um, in parts of the UK. Mm. That can have quite knock-on effects, can't it, to other 
um, species. What, what, how does that, how, you know, how do you consider that kind of what, what can they, you know, for in terms of predators and what, how does that work? I guess the red kite is kind of a, a success story. I mean, it was a very, uh, had very high populations before they were uh, made extinct across most of the UK. They've been reintroduced, that's successful. I don't think there's much contention. There have been some issues of poisoning of red kites. I, there are probably more contentious um, species such as uh, sea eagles. Um, there, there's a lot of opposition to re reintroduction of those. Um, and, you know, payment for farmers to compensate for offtake of lambs. And I suppose we, we come back to other species such as beavers. I think there's a lot of resistance to reintroducing beavers to many parts of the UK. But there have been um, escapes of captive populations. And we saw that was quite successful. They're good ecosystem engineers. So they can actually reduce flooding. They build their dams, um, can reduce flooding downstream. And we now see that there are real tangible benefits to that kind of ecosystem engineering by beavers. And uh, I don't know if people are aware there was a reintroduction or a scheme to reintroduce beavers to parts of Plymouth uh, catchments it, within the, the wider Plymouth area. Very steep, flashy catchments, flashy in terms of rapid increase in, in water levels to try and increase, uh, sorry, reintroduce beavers into those areas to prevent flooding downstream. So from what 15, 20 years ago might have seemed a little bit crazy and, and, and out there, we're now realizing that there are real benefits and we don't need lots of investment in hard, hard engineering and trying to manage river systems, which I think we all know is, is really difficult thing to do. Rivers will tend to do what they want to do, but we can use species such as beavers to help us live with the rivers. Yeah, I actually, um, I, th I think one of our colleagues, uh, Tom, as you mentioned, Tom Lavers, is actually, um, he's going to be talking a bit about this in a, in a few weeks time, but he, he's actually published some research with some other colleagues on the civil engineering side of things to look at how we can, you know, how much of an impact we can actually have from integrating damage. Yeah. Um, so really, oh, hopefully I didn't say too much there and step on his toes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure he'll be fine. Um, but you just to kind of go on then from what you mentioned, you said there was opposition. Where would, what, what what's the reason then for opposition? Oh, sorry, in terms of if, well, of you, you mentioned you, you mentioned there were people that would oppose the reintroduction of beavers. Why why is that the case? Then? What, what, where does this opposition come from? Well, I suppose it doesn't sound like it could be farming communities or rural communities, and where beavers occur, they you do get flooding. So you know what might be prime agricultural land where farmers making a living, um, then by putting a beaver dam in place or a beaver dam appearing there, you might get flooding of those agricultural lands. So they're, they're losing a source of income. Um, so, you know, you can see the arguments from both sides and it is trying to balance those arguments. And it's difficult in a sort of a densely populated country such as the UK and many other countries in Western Europe what are the what are the benefits what are the negatives and, and how do we balance these you know should there should there be payments to to those farmers because of that flooding should they be compensated because uh, ultimately you know by the introduction of these dams management of the water systems you don't have to pay for impacts of flooding in downstream urban areas the, the quality of water might be improved by these dams as well by these beaver dams so you know, it's, it, as I say, it's a really complex set of issues and no, no single answer. So, yeah, sorry, I don't really have a, a, a definitive no, no, but we, anybody does, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And actually you did, because what I want to, you know, I think the thing to go from that is actually, you know, we, this is very much a physical geography talk, um, you know, tackling some of the real big physical geography questions. But actually, you know, this all comes together. This is all geography. And, you know, you have to have that social side of things and the, the working with farmers, working with landowners to really understand some of these really complex challenges, I think, is, is what I was trying to get at, really. Um, yeah. So our, our teaching and our research, we do a lot of field-based work. When, when we're able to do, we do, do take students into the field when conditions allow. And we, we talk about these kind of issues and quite often bring in relevant parties, perhaps landowners and 
it is exploring this diversity of issues and, and how different people perceive them. Yeah, definitely. So another one that's come in. Um, you mentioned obviously invasive species. Um, how do they get to the UK? A number of ways. They could be uh, intentionally introduced. Uh, the fishing, you know, in the same way that we, we now find uh, trout uh, came from the UK in South African streams, and they can have a big impact because people, the, the, the British who first went to South Africa wanted to, to recreate that little bit of England, bringing trout, bringing things like uh, weeping willows next to rivers. They don't have natural controls there, natural, uh, yeah, natural controls on their spread, so they can become invasive. So things like the, yeah, the uh, crayfish, they could have been introduced. Um, and then we can then introduce things like the, the, the signal crayfish plague. I said we could put that in a river and that can have the plague. But even things, we need to think about things like biosecurity. So that, that plague, that bacteria can remain on a boot. So a fisherman who's had waders on in one stream where the signal crayfish is present, they don't clean their equipment between going to there and another river. We don't actually need to introduce the organism. We can reintroduce the plague on, on equipment that we're using. So we need to be aware of that. Um, so it, it can be accidental. It can be ballast water. You know, there's instances of invasive um, bivalves being introduced to new coastal areas through ballast water. Fresh water, obviously, um, just people planting things because they think they look nice. Um, I suppose rhododendrons in the UK, they came originally from the Himalayas, but they had natural predators, pests, which get them in check, introduced by the Victorians to the UK because they look nice, they had pretty flowers, but they quickly spread here. They can quickly um, overtake vast areas of, of native woodland, decrease the native ground flora, and sometimes completely obliterate it so a whole range of reasons i think that biosecurity side of things is really interesting and that um understanding and again going back to that conservation approach and what making sure that we, we you know consider what we're doing i think is so important it's such a really interesting topic um yeah even you know as as, as conservationists as as researchers we need to be aware of this when we're undertaking field work so our students here we need to make them aware of that a-level students, if they're planning on doing research in river systems, they need to be aware of it. We need to, yeah, be biosecure, make sure these pieces of equipment are clean between each use. Yeah. Um, another question then, last one to wrap us up. Have we ever refound a species we previously thought was extinct? Uh, the black-footed ferret. Uh, you know the example that I gave. Uh, do you mean in the UK or...? Well, in, the, in the UK, this was specifically, yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think. We may have found new populations. I mean, I think, for example, the, the pine martin is probably more widespread than we thought it was. 15, 20 years ago, we thought it was probably really restricted to um, pine woodlands in the north of Scotland. But we now think there is evidence that it is found more wider through the UK, down into England, down into Wales. Um, and that's through sprints, for example, through droppings from these animals from fur. They're, they're very secretive. We don't necessarily see them unless we intentionally go out to do a systematic survey. And, the, you know, it's thought that they are now more wise, but then they are good at controlling grey squirrels, which is another introduced species, which carries obviously a disease that is more impactful on the, the native red squirrel population. But it's thought that in areas where we get the, the pine martins, then the grey squirrel populations are very much reduced and kept in check because the grey squirrels are a lot bigger, a lot tastier. It's, you know, a lot more effort for the pine martins to go and catch a red squirrel and eat that for, for less return. So, I probably haven't answered your question there specifically. I don't know. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It's probably something I should have looked up whether we have found, we found a species. But we've definitely found some that are less threatened and more widely dispersed than we, we possibly thought previously. No, that's perfect. 
That was absolutely fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, really fantastic insight into to how geography and biology really knit together so beautifully um, and, and what we can do and what some of our challenges are for. for it. So thank you so much for, for, for your time with that and for answering the question so well. Really, That's really okay. Fun. Sorry about the technical challenges. I don't know if it was on my end and I hope it caught it. So. It's fine. Don't worry. They, as long as everyone can still hear us, which they can, I definitely checked. We're good. Um, so okay. thank you to everyone that's, that's uh, listened today. Thank you to everyone that's, that's watched. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will be back again next Wednesday at 4.30 for a session with Dr. Marion McClellan looking at, uh, looking at development in particular. So I will see you next Wednesday. The session will be hosted by uh, Dr. Jay Catterson. So she will be seeing you then. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you to the RGS as always for, for, for advertising everything and for supporting this. But also to uh, Dr. Matt Blackett for sat, sat bit, sitting behind in the background, sawing all the tech as always. Um, because I think you've got a few issues with Zoom, Mike, I think you can probably, um, if I think hopefully Matt will be able to so uh, end the session down but thank you all very much and um that's that brilliant cheers guys and i'll see you next week thank you, thank you.